All right, perfect. It is 12 o'clock and I will not keep everyone away from lunch for too long. Um, so I'm Nikita. I'm one of the co-founders and chief product officer at Artificial. And for those of you who don't know what Artificial does, uh, we're a startup, we're about four years old, and we build software tools to make it easier for labs to automate. Um, so when we actually came to the first SLAS, I remember having a tiny like robot with April tags at the Precise booth. Um, so it's been really awesome to kind of grow this community. I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Um, so thank you to everyone for kind of embracing us from the robot world um, and helping us feel welcome as part of the lab automation space. So I wanted to start with these two pictures. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard about generative AI and all the hype around it. Um, so I like to kind of get on the train and I asked Dolly what the lab of the future looked like. And it basically spat out these two images for me. Um, and I think, you know, this is obviously future oriented, but I think it gets to two kind of core principles that we all talk about a lot when it comes to the lab of the future. Um, the first one is really tools for scientists. Like imagine a world where everything is in AR and VR and you can virtually model everything before you touch the physical world. And then there's this vision of like a perfect lab where automation is tucked away and you tell it the experiment and the room kind of just does everything it needs to do. But reality often looks a lot different. And so whenever we go and talk to different labs, there's still a ton of Google Sheets. There's a lot of USBs. There's still lots of paper and there's a lot of different software that has to be stitched together in order to get the physical world to run it all. And so what we see is when a scientist wants to run an experiment, they have to cobble all of these things together and what they end up with is data that it's untraceable and often lives in a USB somewhere that has to be dug up. And so this kind of gets to the question of like, why is that, right? And I think I spent the bigger part of the last 10 years trying to solve this problem of people, automation and robots and really messy dynamic environments. And I think this absolutely holds true in the scientific space where you have scientists, you have a lot of automation and robots and machines, and then you have experiments that are changing all the time. And so it gets to this point of like, how do I actually build tools that can evolve when the science evolves? And how do I make it so that the robots and automation isn't that intimidating? And so the way we do that at Artificial is really using digital twins and software. And so our platform allows the scientists to come in and say, this is an experiment I want to run. We have all sorts of tools for them to be able to schedule and manage and run that experiment and be guided through how to use all the different types of equipment that you see on the show floor. And really importantly, what you end up with on the other side is a complete and contextualized data record that tells you everything that happened as part of that experiment. So the way we do that is something called digital twins, which I'm sure many of you have heard about. It's another one of the buzzwords. And I think it means a lot of different things to different people. Um, in essence, a digital twin is essentially a virtual version of a physical object process or a system. But in the context of artificial, this lets you essentially plan out your entire facility with a complete physical model like you see on the left over there, do things like monitor in real time, build all sorts of tools for scientists to know what's happening in their lab, and really importantly, actually collect structured and contextualized data. Um, so I know how that data is collected, what the physical reality looked like at that point. So to dig in a little deeper, um, if you go to a lab today, there's the physical world where you have lots of people, labware, files, USBs moving around and lots of machines. And then you often have the digital space, which has like analytical pipelines or ELNs or LIMS, and they don't talk to each other. So you end up in the situation of being like, the digital space is like, tell me what's going on. And so what we do with respect to closing that loop is essentially create a digital twin of the entire physical space. We know what's happening, what equipment is being used and when, what data is moving around, and all of that data gets fed into the digital twin that Artificial has. We use that to essentially create all sorts of insights, ways that you could schedule your lab operations better and turn it into information and insights that can be fed back into the physical world in order to improve the way things run. So to share kind of how that actually works in practice, we have four core applications. The first three that you see in white are really what we call our editors. And so this is a set of tools that automation engineers like yourselves and software engineers and scientists can use to customize everything for their lab. So the first of those is called labs, it's a lab editor. And you can really quickly and drag and drop, like I'll show you, build out a complete digital twin like you saw in the other slides of your complete lab environment. The second is what we call assistance. And so that's essentially like those 200 page SOPs that everyone has in a lab. You digitize them, you show them with the digital twin and an operator or scientist can really easily walk through everything they need to do. 
And then the workflow editor, if you came to my co-founder David's talk yesterday, you probably heard a deep dive, but it's really the set of tools to take all of the workflows and processes that you're running in a lab and standardize them and version them with codes and digital twins. And then all of that comes together in what we call our lab ops application. And that's really the central command center for everything running in a lab, where you would go and schedule and manage all the experiments. So to dig in a little deeper, this is a video of our labs application. And what we've done on the right here is take all the equipment, a lot of the stuff you see on the show floor, and integrate the models of that equipment into our ecosystem. And so for each equipment, what you see highlighting in green is essentially what we call common sense lab physics. You can think of this like all the tribal knowledge in the mind of automation engineers. How do we encode that into a tool so that it's easy to say things like what is compatible with what? or where can plates fit, and what tube can go into this carrier. And so really quickly, in the browser, I can build out this complete digital twin of the lab that I have. And so a lot of our customers use this for layout and planning to figure out like different configurations and different equipment they could use, and really iterate and share that within the lab context. You can take that same digital twin, and we have an editor for what we call assistance. And here, I can take all of those SOPs that are often in a lab and on paper, and actually digitize them with Markdown. So I can do things like have simple math operations for quantities, like maybe the amount of buffers, 4x the number of sample plates, um, and actually put all of that into a dynamic guide. I can also do things like add user entry fields for lot numbers or data that I may want to collect while the operator is actually running through setup or cleanup of any of these processes, and add warnings and all sorts of other content like videos and images to make it a little bit easier to use all the automation that's within the lab context. The third application is called workflows. And so here we have the digital twin and then our Python SDK. And the idea here is that I can actually describe and version all the workflows in my lab, including automated steps using our adapter library that connects to a lot of the instruments that are in here and then any informatic steps, so talking to limb systems like Benchling and ELNs, and then any manual steps by actually referring to some of the assistance that you saw earlier. So what you have is an entire orchestrated flow that includes people, machines, and data all being ver versioned and managed as part of a single ecosystem. And then finally, uh, we have our lab ops application. And so this is an example of all of that coming together into this command center. And so an operator or a scientist or automation engineer can know exactly how their lab is running at any given point. They can see in the digital twin if anything needs help. So that yellow is like, this lab needs a little bit of attention for someone to load or unload any of the stuff. You can go in and see where your experiments at, add any notes and add some of that context that's really useful in the experimental process. And really just know at any given point from home, manage labs that are globally distributed, but know exactly what's running at any given time. For operators and scientists in lab ops, you can also go in and actually walk through those assistants. So say I have to do a loading job and it has four samples, this guide will show you exactly how much of each reagent or buffer or sample you need and give you a dynamic view of exactly what you need to do to get it set up for a run. And so this can be incredibly valuable from a training perspective, also getting scientists and operators to use different equipment, which may have lots of different software. Um, and really be like a single pane of glass with which you can access all the instruments in your lab. When everything is said and done, you get a complete and contextualized data record. And this is really where Artificial's journey ends. And so you can see an exact record of exactly what happened, who touched the samples, if there was any notes or errors or logs that came off of the systems. We'll consolidate all of the results files. And then often our customers take this and put it into a LIMS or AWS or whatever they need to do in their downstream analytics pipeline. So hopefully that gave everyone kind of a quick overview of the ways that digital twins can be useful um, for monitoring and process control and ways to enhance all of their lab processes. And so I will stop there. And if you guys are interested, uh, definitely come by our booth at 1048 and we'd love to share a demo and dig in a little deeper. So any questions? <laughs> Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, great question. Um, so the way we do that is like each of those digital twins that you saw, you can build one for like as many labs as you want. And then we give you global visibility into all of them. So even if they're spread across different locations, you could come to the lab ops dashboard and see the state of each of those labs. Um, so you can create infinite number of labs if you chose to. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Good question. Um, so we track all the plates as they move around the digital twin. Um, so we keep a data model of like where the plates are and what part of storage or anything that they might be in. Um, if it's outside the scope of the lab, then that might be something that your limbs cares about. But while it's in the context of like running around the lab, we keep track of all the plates. Um, so if you look at like the digital twin also, you can see where the plates are at any point in a process. And you could look at like the storage rack or anything and visually see them there. <laughs> Yeah. Good question. Um, so the question was around maintenance. And um, one of the things we have done is like have rules like for every like hundredth run, then ask the operator to do maintenance on this piece of instrument. So we'll track how many runs have happened since someone ran like a maintenance assistant. Um, we don't currently do any like triggers off of like a maintenance step, but that's something folks have asked about and it's certainly in our scope of what we would build out. Um, but we definitely have like tools like, oh, like you could record in that, like I want to have a run happen, a maintenance happen at 300 runs or so. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so that piece of it, we're still like building out, but in terms of like generating rules, you can absolutely do that with this. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so an example of that is like with our adapters to like a sealer, let's say when a sealer runs out of seals, mm -hmm. like it can notify a user to be able to up and add more seals. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. yeah. Um, in terms of the tracking of the steps <laughs> as an API. <laughs> yep. We don't have any additional sensing that we add to instruments themselves. Um, if there's like rules, like, you know, every five runs, the reservoir runs out, for example, you could encode those in like manually, um, but we wouldn't add any additional sensors unless you have one and want it to communicate with the platform. So. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. So enjoy lunch.